Okay. So welcome everyone to the Irish American Heritage Museum as our centenary series uh, commemorating the War of Independence and the Irish Civil War continues. We're delighted today to have with us um, Michael Collins's biographers, um, Anne Dolan, Dr. Anne Dolan and Dr. William Murphy. Um, Anne Dolan is the Associated Professor of Modern Irish History at Trinity College Dublin. Her previous publications include Commemorating the Irish Civil War, History and Memory, 1923 to 2000. She's joint editor of No Surrender Here, the Civil War Papers of Ernie O'Malley, and she has co-written uh, Michael Collins' The Man and the Revolution with Dr. Murphy earlier on. Dr. Murphy is an associate professor in modern Irish history at Dublin City University. He's author of Political Imprisonment and the Irish, 1912 to 1921, and he has co-edited the Gaelic Athletic Association in 1884 to 2009, as well as Leisure and the Irish in the 19th century. Uh, today, they're going to discuss Michael Collins um, from new sources, from Michael Collins' own diaries. Uh, the diaries kind of change what we know about him, really. Um, he kept these diaries throughout the War of Independence and the Civil War. And of course, his own evolution uh, to become, you know, sort of a, one of the most famous men and most powerful men in Ireland at that time uh, is documented, too. And so they'll reflect on his own transformed life uh, through his own words. So we're delighted to have you both. And thank you very much for joining. I'm going to minimize myself now here and um, let you take it away. <laughs> thanks very much, Elizabeth. And you know, we begin by really confirming that thanks to you. We're very grateful to the invitation to uh, participate uh, today and you know, to have a chance to talk to the audience at the Irish American Heritage Museum. Um, so I suppose we might begin with some information about how the book came about. In November of 2021, the late, the family of the late Liam Collins, a nephew of Michael Collins, loaned the set of diaries, which are the base of this book, to the National Archives of Ireland. There are five, dating from the years 1918 to 1922. And in a minute, we'll say a little bit a little bit about what they look like and what their basic functions were for Collins. The diaries have not been widely available before, some early biographers saw them. We can infer this because we recognise occasional references to information from the diaries, in, for instance, the work of Rex Taylor. The family also loaned some of the diaries to the Bureau of Military History back in the 1940s, and photocopies of some of the diaries exist among the papers of that project. The development of last autumn, however, ensured that the original diaries were going to be in the hands of a national institution and that they would become more accessible. Immediately, Zoe Reid at the National Archives of Ireland set about the task of conserving and digitising the diaries with the purposes of making digital versions available to the public at Bishop Street in Dublin, which is where the National Archives uh, are based, and at the Michael Collins House Museum in Clonakilty. Uh, this has now happened. Meanwhile, as authors of a 2018 biographical study of Collins, with Collins Press in Cork, which Elizabeth mentioned in her introduction, we responded to an invitation from Orla McBride, who is the director of the National Archives, to produce something that would introduce the diaries. And it was from this invitation that, that the book emerged. Days in the Life, Reading the Michael Collins Diaries, published by the National Archives uh, in conjunction with the Royal Irish Academy. In the process of writing the book, we had access to the diaries themselves for a few precious hours, on a couple of occasions, uh, but largely a work from digital images sent to us by Zoe Reid and some di digital images that we took ourselves uh, in the while we, while, we had, while we had access to the diaries. Uh, many of the images we show you here were taken by Zoe and they appear in the book, uh, but there are a few others that we took ourselves and apologies if the quality of our images aren't quite up to the scratch of Zoe's. So, um, yeah. So as I say, uh, there are five. The first three, 1918 to 1920, are working pocket diaries. In the case of 1918, for example, TJ and J Smith uh, of Charterhouse Square, London produced it. Smith was a leading manufacturer of diaries and this one belonged to a range the company promoted as automatic self-registering diaries. And you can see an image of that uh, up on screen at the moment. <laughs> 
And the defining gimmick was a steel spring which held the owner's pencil in place, allowing it to double job as a bookmark. This ensured, as the ads explained, the page last written upon immediately found on opening the book with pencil ready to hand. The pocket diary market had been growing rapidly since the 1890s, encouraging companies like TJ and J. Smith to produce an ever greater variety designed and branded to meet a range of needs, indeed an array of self-images. This one said clever, business-like, practical, ideal for the busy office manager and revolutionary. Unsurprisingly, Collins did not complete a page titled Personal Notes, leaving blank not simply his name, address and telephone number, but his glove, collar, boot and hat size, as well as his height and weight. He did paste a listing of Irish MPs from 1916 inside the front cover. You can see that on the far left of the slide, or at least part of it. Keeping count, he struck through the departed, replacing each in pen with the by-election victor. In 1919, he switched from a burgundy cover to a red faux leather and to a Collins Gentleman's Diary number 174. And you can see that on the right hand side. The 1918 diary, the first one, was small, 12 centimetres long, seven and a half centimetres wide and less than a centimetre deep, snug in his hand and safe in his pocket. Each week laid out across facing pages, Saturday, Sunday to Saturday, in bold green print and in separate boxes, the daily boxes framed in red and lined in grey. The 1919, and you can see that here in the middle, let's see the middle image on the screen currently. The 1919 Collins Gentleman Diary afforded him a page a day and consequently was slightly thicker, but the purpose did not change. And you can see that on the left here. And we've put up a particular entry, which is um, the day after De Valera's escape from Lincoln Jail. And you can see Collins having a little celebration to himself over the fact that the news has made the papers and you know there's a sensation around the escape. These diaries... Um, uh, were functional and in that sense only essential. They did not give his life meaning. He did not interrogate himself, nor did he explain himself to anyone else. Instead, these pages helped him to get to meetings on time most of the time. Do not imagine careful compositions, products of pause and contemplation, but hurried notes, necessary lists, addresses, aid memoir, lists of donations, calculations, things to do, things not done, accumulations, asides, abbreviations, Lots and lots of abbreviations. One of our tasks was to try and figure out what the abbreviations meant. Come 1920, he invested again in a Collins gentleman's diary, exactly the same, but black. He used it a lot in the first half of 1920, and his work on the Daw loan featured prominently, but there are very few entries at all for the final months of 1920, while the diary for 1921 begins only in October. Uh, perhaps he had just come to consider carrying a pocket diary too dangerous in late 1920 and early 1921 when things had gotten really hot during the War of Independence. On Wednesday, the 12th of October 1921, during the treaty negotiations in London, he resumed. From that day to the end, he was at it again, noting, listing and recording. Gradually, from late 1921 and definitively by 1922, he was essentially creating and working through what were daily to-do lists. Uh, on somewhat larger pages of a notebook, which he transformed into a diary by writing the day and date at the top. And you can see an example of that on the right hand side from November of 1921. So our job then was to try to introduce this source. And in some ways, at first glance, there was not a lot to work with, which appeared to be a difficulty, but then became the challenge of the task. Importantly, it forced us to look again and again and to look closely. The pages are not blank after all. In his diaries, Michael Collins chose to write particular words on particular days, and usually the words were identifiable. That did not sure that their meaning was clear, at least not to us. Almost certainly each meant something then to him, though even he will have been confused, have cursed his own hand, or have forgotten the intended import of a phrase after a time. Which goes to make the diaries all the more intimately his. The last page we have, for example, is for a Sunday, the 6th of August, 1922. It begins one inspection barracks today and continues two mass before it ends three. And then there's a blank. He didn't fill in what number three was. The Michael Collins of that day in August 1922 seems farther away and closer to us in the words and in the gaps in the one and the two, but also the three, the almost written down. Anne will have 
uh, more to say about the absences in a few minutes. Leaving those aside for a moment or two, our first key task became to try and make sense of as many of the entries as we could. We tried to do this by drawing on our existing knowledge of Collins and of the revolution, and also by doing some new research. While figuring out and contextualizing the individual entries, we also try to identify some patterns or key themes. And the final book is organized essentially around these patterns or themes, which we identified. There are 21, an introduction of 21 short essays in the book. Uh, and what we found uh, did change our angle of visions on Collins and on the revolution. These little diaries, which ordered out his individual days at once sped time up and slowed it down. It is, as, it is as if someone is showing us a newsreel, often too fast and then suddenly too slow. We get the relentless pace of revolution, but also a slow grind of individual days. We see him interacting with so many people, rushing about doing things that we now think were important, yet he experienced all of it in the myths of the everyday, the personal and the mundane, which also appear in the diary. And I'm going to hand over to Anne now. Great. Thanks, Will. And again, thanks to Elizabeth for inviting us. Um, as Will hinted, there are many gaps in the diaries. And if we maybe move on to the next slide, that's great. Thanks, Will. Um, he doesn't make it easy for us. And I think it would be odd if, if he did. There's a lot that simply isn't there. Things that don't get mentioned. Names we might expect that don't appear. He writes nothing of becoming a TD, a cabinet minister, nothing about Solihead Beg or the meeting of the first doll. He becomes director of intelligence without comment and makes no note of the first or any other shootings by the squad. Silent for some of the hardest months, the 1921 diary only begins in October in London and falls quiet two days before the treaty was signed. So the 6th of December passes without remark. The Dáil voted on the treaty, he became chairman of the provisional government, Sir Henry Wilson was killed, all without a word from Collins in his diaries, not a word. If we see these and his many other silences in the diaries as significant gaps, then perhaps more fool us. An empty 6th of December 1921 is a sharp reminder, if one were needed, was that is that his five diaries were chiefly, as Will said, engagement books and to-do lists. They were neither a companion or a confidant for him not the place for him to pour out his heart, not the last piece in the Collins puzzle for us to solve. In many respects, they just set us with a whole host of new ones. The very different diary he kept during his brief time in Sligo jail is maybe further proof of this. He had read his Mitchell and his Clark well enough to know that a pocket diary like these ones, with such small spaces for each passing day, was not going to be up to the jail journal job. He refers to a big diary in his February 1922 pocket diary, which again confirms that his own diary was maybe a private supplement to a more formal or official appointment book that he had uh, he was using by then as head of the provisional government. So these five diaries were largely notes of the things he needed to remember, and that doesn't necessarily make them repositories of the most important things. He knew he'd signed the treaty. He didn't need to write it down. So rather than conceive of his silences as missing parts, perhaps we need a different angle of approach. If we conceive of Collins as an extraordinary figure living through an extraordinary time, the diaries are something of a jolt. That familiar chronology that rushes through the revolution that carries Collins swiftly from one significant moment to the next is in these diaries slowed down to the pace of a day and each day comes as likely concerned with his ordinary as well as his remarkable life. You can see on the the right hand side of this slide, an entry from the 5th of August 1922, where he made note amongst other things just down at the bottom crossed out, you can see leggings, um, uh, what is it, knickers, socks, uh, collars for his uniform, um, etc. And that same morning, the newspapers were full of the funeral of Harry Boland, but there was no mention in his diary of Boland's death. We might choose to read that silence as callous, but Collins wrote of Boland's loss of his own remorse in a more fitting place in letters to Kitty Kiernan. So maybe it's our assumptions that need to readjust. His diary isn't silent, rather those August pages hum with how he filled those harrowing days. The diaries are very full of names, but names are rarely constant. People come and go in them. And there is that same scope to read more than we might into the gaps. 
names we might instinctively associate with Collins, like Gleam Tobin, Tom Cullen, Joe O'Reilly, Richard Mulcahy, individuals who later wrote of themselves as Collins' closest confidants, such as Pierce Beasley, David Nelligan or Bat O'Connor, make only frequent, fleeting, infrequent appearances. And left to the diaries alone, one might question how much they really were, as Bat O'Connor's book said, with Michael Collins in the fight for Irish independence. But they, like so many others, were perhaps so essential, so ubiquitous. Why would he bother to write their names down? As 1919 moved into 1920, as Will hinted, he might have been mindful of the consequences of his diaries being captured, that any name written was at risk. But apparent gaps maybe had other causes too. Austin Stack is there through 1918 and 1919, but as Collins's responsibilities changed, Stack's name all but disappeared. Direct references to Mrs. Dev, as he called her, appear in the diary just as often as to her husband. But it would be unwise of us to assume Eamon de Valera wasn't on his mind. Maybe because he write, wrote about them so rarely, his direct notes of momentous moments kind of stand more starkly out. And why he chose what he chose is open to surmise. In response to the German plot arrests of mid-May 1918, he wrote, as we'll see in the next slide, of arrest of many Sinn Féin, saw the detectives at my own lodgings and eluded them. That's a that slightly faint um, reference that, or, or entry there on Friday the 17th of May. The following day, which is slightly easier to see, he added a rather, we might see, naive postscript where he says, appointments not entered after this date as I'll be on the run. Why he needed to tell himself he was on the run, we're not sure. For several weeks after, he wrote each day, quite assiduously, a capital letter R, which we think stands for him being on the run. These entries might reflect a new urgency, a new danger to what he was doing, but it wasn't long before those appointments, as he called them, crept back in again. And he seemed to record the global as well as the local. As we'll see on the next slide, like many around the world, he noticed the he noted the armistice on the 11th of November, 1918, though he spelt it, as many pronounced it, armistice. And on the 28th of June the following year, he noted the Treaty of Versailles with the following entry, peace was signed at 3.15pm today. Made ministerial statement on finance, he wrote on the 9th of May 1919, which maybe says something of the personal pride the relief of giving his first important speech to a dull meeting as Minister for Finance. His entry that just read MC, c, &C or Michael Collins, Commander-in-Chief, was his more muted response to becoming head of the army in the opening weeks of civil war. His note of the 29th of June 1922, attack on the four courts continued, is spare enough for it to be a statement of fact, but its brevity might just as well reveal a heavy heart and this is where the diary entries are actually very challenging in the sense they are so brief. There is that temptation to read far more into them, maybe than he implied, or else to, to read them as, as sometimes, as, as in the Boland case, as quite callous entries. They are very slight at times. Written in fragments more often than sentences, the temptation, as I said, is to put a sense that suits us on what he writes. His silences might well discommode us, but in these notes written in the passing of a moment, he remains a Collins who very clearly refuses to be pinned down. And I think one of the things we were struck by is the presence of things we weren't expecting. And one of those um, really was his family and the degree to which his family life really played a role in these diaries that most of the biographers that have written about him to date really haven't maybe considered his family quite as much as they might. And I think in a way the diary will the diaries will change that. And I think what the diaries show us is that his family life had his rhythms, had its rhythms much like his working week. Sunday seemed to be his day for writing home, a habit perhaps formed young in London and maintained at least through 1918 and 1919. Home was people as much as a place. Home meant his sister, Kate, sisters Katie and Mary, his sister-in-law Katie. But home most often meant Hanny, the sister whom he had lived and grown up with in London, the one who knew the man he had turned into best. The arrival of a letter from Hanny was worth noting in his diary and the disappointment of her not arriving in Dublin as planned in May 1919 was certainly remarked in the diary. She appeared again in the diary through his time in London in 1921. He went to see her regularly and he saw her again when he returned there in early 1922. 
As in any family, some siblings stay closer than others. The address in Chicago for PJ Collins, as he was noted, scribbled at the back of the 1920 diary, suggests the stranger his older brother Patrick could become. His diaries show that he thought of home at those times when home was most certain to be missed. You can see on the right hand side of the slide here on Sunday, the 13th of April, 1919, he lists out, wrote Hanny, Katie, Celestine and Kate, Katty. Um, the 14th of April was the anniversary of his mother's death. So he'd written to his three sisters and his sister-in-law on, on this, on the Sunday, the day before that. And he went home again at those times when families were supposed to gather. And you can see this again and again in the diary notes about going home for St. Patrick's Day, for Easter in 1918, for the new year and in the summer of 1919, for Christmas as the doll tore itself apart in 1921, for St. Patrick's Day again in 1922. Of course, when he went to Cork, there were collections to be made, speeches to give, elections to canvas for. But the diary entry that said, to Cork, to Manway by car to Clonakilty, ended with one resonant word, home. It might be the place he grew out of and grew beyond, but he hankered at those obvious times for Cork, for Woodfield, for home. As the youngest of eight, Collins was known in the family as baby to his siblings. He had become, though, this baby had become the most powerful man in the country by 1921. How that changed his family's sense of him is quite impossible to know, but his diaries show him taking on new responsibilities for his siblings as the years went on. And particularly you see this in the diary where his sister's his sister Mary's husband dies and you see him start to take on a role in her life. You can see him making doctor's appointments for his brother, Sean. But it had also become dangerous to be the sibling of Michael Collins. And he knew Sean in particular had paid a heavy price in the damage that was want, done to the family home at Woodfield. But that said, it seems clear, even from these spare diaries, that when he became the notorious Michael Collins, his place in that family fundamentally transformed. In other words, Baby had grown up and had changed them all. And at that, I'll hand you back to Will. So the IRB is everywhere in the diaries, uh, sometimes in ways that it should not be. During 1919, Collins regularly took the role of what seems to have been the meeting of his IRB circle. For example, on the 24th of April 1919, here on the right of the slide, he noted 26 were present, seven excused and two absent. More than that, he wrote elected M. Collins. And you can see there's a sort of an O or um, a circle beside it, which we think means his, is his symbol for centre or head of the revolutionary cell. And then underneath, J. Noonan, who is uh, secretary and uh, Joe Furlong, treasurer. Uh, Sean Noonan and Joe Furlong, along with Joe's brother Matt, had been companions of Collins since the London days and had participated in the rising with him. Um, the IRB was a political ambition, an instrument of revolution. The very name calls to mind conspiracy, violence and a certain attitude to the world. Depending on your point of view, it was an identity forged in social activity, an elite version of patriotic Irish manliness, a vampire feeding on the organisations built by others, an anti-democratic menace, or all of these. It may not have been family, but it was also a feeling of solidarity. It too was sentiment and obligation. On Tuesday, the 5th of March, uh, 1918, and you can see the entry here in front on, on this slide. Um, Michael Collins wrote in his diaries, removal of Matty Morphy three o'clock from Matter H, Matter Hospital, uh, to Fairview Chapel. And on the next day, funeral of Matty Morphy at three o'clock. Uh, the Irish Independent reported that several companies of volunteers attended the removal and that the coffin was draped with Republican colours. Murphy was, the headline said, a 67 man dead. Few obscure old Fenians received quite so grand a send-off. Matty Murphy was no Jeremiah O'Donovan and no other features in this way in Michael Collins' diaries. But then Matty Murphy, widower, weaver, retired to Artane, was the father of John Murphy and John carried the tradition. It had taken him to raid the magazine fort at the Phoenix Park on Easter week 1916 and into Stafford Jail and Frongock Camp with Michael Collins, the two places Collins was taken after the Rising as well. Uh, and prisons feature a lot. 
Michael Collins' relationship to prisons changed in January 1922 when he became chairman of the provisional government. During the War of Independence, Dáil Éireann could claim an army, courts, and less convincingly, it depended from place to place, uh, police. Uh, but the counter-state's attitude to prisons had remained just that, counter. As the head of the new state's executive, however, Collins became responsible for a prison system that he had, till very recently, attacked on a regular basis. At first, the implications were pleasant enough. There were, for instance, releases to oversee. On the 28th of January 1922, Collins' diary lists three names followed by Borstal Institute Clonmel, General Dalton wrote on 24th. Two of these names were that of Joseph Dillon and Patrick Kwan, who were 17 and 16 years old on the 28th of April 1921, when they were sentenced to three years under the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act by a Field General Court Martial at Limerick City. Their offence was larceny of a bicycle. When Dillon and Quan had, quote, commandeered the bike from John McNamara, a messenger boy from, from an O'Connell Street chemist, they told him, again, quotation, it was for the purposes of the IRA and under IRA rules. The Borstal's register confirms that Dillon and Quan were released on the 24th of January 1922 by order of government. So obviously, General Dalton's letter had arrived. They were lucky. Con Shine from Clark's Bridge in Cork was not so fortunate. Uh, whilst uh, in that city on Friday the 23rd of June, and you can see the 1922, and you can see the entry here on the right hand side, uh, campaigning at the general election of that month, Cork did note number seven in his list of things that day, Con Shine Clonmel Prison. Most likely one of Shine's relatives had pressed the 18-year-old's case on the most powerful man in Ireland, uh, probably way late him while he was campaigning or walking around the city. But Shine was to remain a note not crossed through, one in a list of nine Collins made that day. And you, can, you can see that all the others have been crossed through, but Con Shine you know, is the only one not. Uh, a single task left unattended, it seems. And indeed, the records of the Clonmel Borstal was seen to confirm this because no order of government arrived for Conshine, whose offences were shop breaking and larceny. By then, 1922, Collins had been campaigning for political prisoners for years. At first, it was a job. In February 1917, Collins had become paid secretary and general office manager of the Irish National Aid and Volunteer Dependence Fund, which was a prisoner support organisation. That organisation not only supported prisoners, but their families from offices at 32 Bachelors Walk in Dublin. And on Saturday, the 5th of January 1918, we find in the diaries a first 3OC at 32. From then till Collins' arrest on the 2nd of April, signposts to meetings at number 32 are a regular feature. After April, there was just one on the 4th of May and none once he left the INA and VDF's employ in early of July. Yet prisoners remained on his mind, albeit for a complex set of reasons. His own experiences as a prisoner had heightened his empathy for and his sense of duty to those who were incarcerated, or at least to some of them, political prisoners especially. For a time too, it was a matter of professional pride and though certain that his own days in prison were wasted, Collins understood the power of political prisoners. He knew the trouble they could cause, that they possessed the capacity to rend hearts, and that an escape was a coup. Um, we've known for a long time, through collections of surviving correspondence, that Collins remained in regular contact with Austin Stack, while the latter led Irish volunteer prisoners at Belfast and subsequently at Strange Ways in Manchester during 1918 and 1919. The diaries do more than confirm this. Wrote Austin, or variations of that phrase, constitute a refrain from July 1918 through to August 1919. On St. Patrick's Day 1919, the, ent the entry Oz corresponds to a letter in which he provided Stack with news of Dublin Corporation support for the campaign of disobedience then ongoing among prisoners at Belfast, and also news of the escape from Mount Joy the night before of Robert Barton. According to Barton, Mick Collins was in the street nearby waiting to congratulate me. And it's surely not too far a stretch to suggest that this was the cryptic tonight's appointment in Collins' diary for Sunday the 16th of March 1919. You can see that's on the left-hand side uh, of the slide there, down at the bottom, you can see the tonight's appointment. 
In that letter of the 17th of March, Collins also mentioned his concern for some of the German plot prisoners released, recently released from England. He said, a few of the men who returned are very poorly, particularly Pauline O'Keefe. Over the preceding fortnight, he had counted them home in his diaries, alive and dead. Uh, and you can see here on the 6th of March, the first noting of that. Uh, first internee arrivals, Cosgrave Guinell on the right hand side, about two thirds of the way down. And more somberly, Pierce McCann died in Gloucester this morning at 2.30. Uh, Pierce McCann was one of the prisoners who had contracted influenza and died uh, you know, just before the releases were, uh, were decided upon by the government around the same time. In fact, the arrival of influenza in the prisoner, prison may have influenced the government's decision to start releasing the prisoners at, the, at that time. Um, a couple of days later, Collins noted P. McCann remains arrived Don Leary, left Kingsbridge, one o'clock. Across 1919, he noted in his diaries the meetings of and donations handed to him for the Irish Republican Prisoners Dependents Fund, which is a sort of successor of the Irish National Aid and Volunteer Dependent Fund. Mount Joy featured in mundane ways on mundane days. Cigarettes for Joy on the 24th of November 1919. And in significant ways on significant days, releases from Joy Today on the 14th of April 1920. And that marked the end of a successful hunger strike in Mount Joy and, uh, at that time. How strange it must have been then on the 7th of July 1922, when Collins found himself considering questions of prisoners and release on guarantees and a note reclaimed and readiness. Yet, if the provisional government was to create its Irish free state, to establish a monopoly of violence in the face of Republican resistance, then Michael Collins faced becoming a jailer on a mass scale. Uh, Collins' days filled with entries such as prison accommodation between eight and nine, note reprison accommodation, Maryborough, Kilkenny, Dundalk, and three, Galway jail, three, A, Sligo jail, four, Waterford jail. Michael Collins spent a lot of time thinking about money. If we were to mistake these diaries for a straightforward map of his mind, then we might come to believe that for the first six months of 1920, he thought about little else. That his every waking hour filled with money, day after day, in long lists, representing amounts to be lodged and acknowledged. This is clearly not so. It is important not to exaggerate nor to lose perspective. And yet the diaries reveal patterns, throwing his working life into relief. Just as they tell us that reorganising the Irish volunteers was a priority for him in the summer of 1918, they confirm in pound signs and figures that the money, the money, the money possessed him for long stretches of 1920. Collins' relationship to the money, to the accumulation and the use of it for revolutionary purposes had been building over several years. At first, we tend to find it encompassed in the word fund. Before the diaries, there was, as we've mentioned, the Irish National Aid and Volunteer Dependence Fund. Then came the Irish Republican Prisoners Dependent Fund, which kept bobbing to the surface throughout with entries such as Seamus Hughes, re-RPD fund or meeting RPD fund. There are just a few examples from 1919. That year, too, on the 19th of May, in his role as Adjutant General of the Irish Volunteers, Collins wrote to Art O'Brien in London, explaining that the headquarters staff had decided to reinstitute what they called the Defence of Ireland Fund, with a huge drawing of prizes, as he described it. He sent down a hundred books of raffle tickets for sale, setting out his expectations. As the Irish abroad cannot take so active a part in volunteer work as those at home, we confidently expect a vigorous effort in the one way that they can be equally useful, the supplying of funds. These diaries suggest that Collins had embarked on a round of arm twisting, Around then. So, for example, on the 6th of May, he wrote Woods about tickets drawing prizes, and on the 8th of May, he wrote Neil redrawing tickets. By then, he had been collecting for another more substantial fund for several months, the Dahl Aaron, uh, Dahl Aaron called it the Self Determination Fund, having improvised it in the early weeks of 1919 as a method of gathering into their new and pretty bare coffers money collected during 1918 for what was a now redundant anti-conscription fund. The money in the anti-conscription fund, which, as the name suggests, was raised uh, to oppose wartime conscription, uh, was due for return to the subscribers, given that this danger had passed. But Dahl Aaron asked the subscribers to instead pass it on to the new cause. 
Collins assumed ultimate responsibility for all of this when he became Minister for Finance on the 2nd of April 1919. And under his direction, the Self-Determination Fund proved the Dáil's most important source of income until the autumn of 1919 bringing in £42,054 uh, up to the 31st of October, and then some smaller amounts after that. On the 9th of May 1919, Collins recorded meeting Dahl today, made ministerial statement and finance. It was his first, and it was worth noting, the speech was a lengthy indictment of the economic exploitation and overtaxation of Ireland since the Act of Union. Most of the time, though, he looked forward, in particular to his new fundraising scheme, usually known as the Dahl Loan. Launched in the autumn of 1919, this offered bonds for sale from £1 to £100 with the aim of raising £250,000 in Ireland, uh, which Collins took charge of, and there was also hope of raising substantial amounts of money in the United States, and de Valera uh, was very much tasked with driving that. Overall, it was an enormous success, if more so in some places than others. The beginnings were modest. On the 25th of October, the diaries indicate Collins wrote to John Reynolds with three certs for name subscribers, just one share each. But gradually, the diaries became a daily accounting of sums, but considerable and modest from various places. The constituency of Mid Cork was one of the success, success stories, built systematically village by town. And you can see the entry here on the slide from the 2nd of February 1920, uh, where he notes A. Ballon colleague and B. Inchigila and McCroom, village towns and villages in that constituency. Uh, and they mirror letters of acknowledgement sent from Collins office to Terence McSweeney, who was the local TD, who was hugely successful as a collector for the law loan. As you can see, Collins has noted passing on the list, presumably of individual subscribers, to DOD. Uh, DOD is Dahi O'Donoghue, who was a crucial figure at the Department of Finance. Uh, he was the man who opened the bank accounts, made the payments, moved the money around, keeping it safe for Collins and the law. A final point is perhaps uh, worth making about the money, and that is the extent to which the Catholic clergy was a conduit for it. As Brian Heffernan has put it, the Sinn Féin priest was a very common phenomenon. In January 1920, priests held the office of president on 24 of Sinn Féin's 87 constituency executives or call a counter. And you can see such men taking an active role in promoting the loan in their communities. So there are a couple of entries here on the right hand, the middle on the right hand side for the 24th and 25th of June. On the 24th of June, Collins wrote Roscommon Inn for North, £830 per Father Glyn Drum Lion. And further down the page, Tyrone, South Dungannon, 195 per Father Maguire. The next day, it was £26.76 per the Reverend Canon Doyle, followed by East Clare, £255.10 shillings, suspense per Father O'Kennedy, again, he's from Clare, and Cavan East, 268.10 Father O'Connell. Okay, now that, it's back to Anne again. Great, thanks, Will. Um... But we might move now from the money over to London um, because the 1921 diary begins only in October. So I think we have to really focus on London and how important London was for him. On the 3rd of December 1921, Michael Collins wrote to Kitty Kiernan on headed paper from 10 Downing Street as follows. He said, Dear Kitty, will you please look at the address? I am actually writing here. So after almost two months of negotiations and three days before signing a treaty in London, he was still obviously impressed by being at that address. It was a long way from Woodfield to Downing Street. And many were quite upset at the sight of him in Downing Street. You can see on the, the letter on the right, this is one of a number of threatening letters that he received when the delegation arrived in London. He's described as Mike the murderer and assassin, uh, although it's slightly oddly spelt. Um, and this idea of Lloyd George's surrender. So it, it gives, I think, something of the atmosphere of, of his arrival in London at that point. His 1921 and 1922 diaries have their share, though, of other daunting London addresses. Places like two Whitehall Gardens, the offices of the Cabinet, the Treasury Boardroom, the Colonial Office, Lord Birkenhead's room in the House of Lords, the Chancellor's room, Churchill's room, two Sussex Gardens, which was Churchill's home, 32 Grosvenor Square, or Grosvenor Gardens, Birkenhead's house, 
and always back to Downing Street. And these new addresses brought new formidable names. With no elaboration, such diary entries sum up uh, how much of his, his position had altered from his last diary entries of 1920. We go from those sums of money Will was just talking about to the, being thrown into this world of London addresses. The diaries give us little more than these names and addresses, but they do reflect just how much Collins's life and work had irrevocably changed. You can see here on this slide, this is him leaving Downing Street rather unsteady on his feet after the first day of negotiations in October. So with this, as he called it himself, the spotlight of a London conference, there came a natural curiosity for those in London to see him or to get a glimpse of him. On the 16th of November, he wrote to Kitty Kiernan as follows, that he said, the Tatler magazine has asked me to give them a sitting for a photograph. And his diary entry of the 17th of November would suggest that he had agreed to play along. It said, 11.30, two photographers came and got their photographs. He wrote in his diary things like Augustus John, 28 Mallard Street, London, or Chelsea, on the 26th of November. John Lavery had already begun to paint his portrait. I sat today for my portrait, my interesting life, he wrote to Kitty. But in noting down Augustus John's name and Chelsea address in his diary, Collins was clearly tempted by the thought of sitting for the artist who had just painted Lawrence of Arabia. So you can see very clearly this, you know, here's this, you know, figure who'd been living in secret for quite some time is now uh, sitting for one portrait and thinking about sitting for a second. His diary records new friendships, presumably born out of that same curiosity. One, the most obvious one is with Sir James Barry, the novelist and playwright, who first appeared in Collins's diary on the 14th of October, 1921. And they continued to meet through those tense last months of that year and again in London in 1922. So John Lavery described their friendship as odd moments, but the diary entries imply the time spent with Barry was perhaps time Collins enjoyed. Barry's plays had been among his favourites as a young theatre goer in London. So even the hardened revolutionary must have been thrilled to spend time with the man who invented Peter Pan. This becoming a public figure in London was certainly used against Collins by those who later took the anti-treaty side. As early as November 1921, rumours, as they were described, of rowdy and drunken conduct at Hans Place and the name of Michael Collins bandied about as central as the central figure in alleged orgies, as another letter put it, could be heard. But his diaries give us little cause to substantiate such accusations and claims. Instead, they order out his London days and nights predominantly in conferences, meetings and work. The treaty negotiations, which began on the 11th of October and ended on the 6th of December, were not, as we might assume, uniform days of negotiation and discussion. Meetings were conducted around the day-to-day -day business of British government. The 1921 diary, which only began, as we said, on the second day of the talks, notes Downing Street meetings at all different times of the day, 11 in the morning, 3.30, 5 in the afternoons. Meeting Downing Street at 5, followed by a special sub-conference on general question was one entry, truce meeting at 3, 5.30 delegation, appointment at 11.30 in the Treasury. And these were just a small sample of the plethora of side meetings that were also part of the negotiations. The schedule of the 13th of October 1921 sums up the type of pressures and movement of these days. It began with a reference to the General Conference at 11, which adjourned at 1.15, then on to a meeting with Lord Beatty and Winston Churchill at the Colonial Office, then from 4.30 until 7pm at a truce committee, and then back to prepare for the next day's work. What Collins thought of it all, he kept for his letters home. It was in those he admitted things like, I am lonely and very, very discontented. In those he confessed, I wish to God I were back home. In his diaries, he just kept going with entries such as 11 o'clock, Lloyd George, etc. exclamation mark. So he said an awful lot with an etc. and an exclamation mark. As head of the provisional government, Collins returned several times to London in 1922, as we'll see on the next slide, his diary entry of the 6th of February uh, of that year provides the detail of one of those later London days. As you can see, it began in Downing Street at 10 a.m. and then on to see his sister, Hanny, uh, and then a variety of meetings, uh, one with Crompton Llewellyn Davis, then on to the Colonial Office at 4.15, and then on to, at 5.30 with Eamon Duggan, he went to see Roger Caseman's diary in the House of Lords, 
and then an hour later back in Downing Street and then back to his hotel, the Durham Court, where he had another conference uh, about procedure to end the day. So the pace was just as fierce as it had been in late 1921 and arguably the tenor of the meetings was just as furious. His electoral pact with de Valera, which had prompted disgust in London, and his first draft, the draft of the Free State Constitution, was so anathema to Lloyd George that he referred to it as a complete evasion and negation of the treaty. For both of these things, Collins was brought to heel at these London meetings, prompting more dispiriting letters home. These two days, he wrote, have been the worst I have ever spent. It would be so pleasant to be relieved of all responsibility. Things are serious, far, far more serious than anyone at home thinks. I wish to God someone else was in the position and not I. Again, in his diaries, though, he shows nothing of this dejection. They record the work, but clearly not the peace of mind that it all cost. But one of the things that's very clear as we move into the 22 diary um, is this idea of, of taking over generally, a phrase which he uses for the first time on the 31st of January 1922. The 1922 diary really does mark a very considerable shift in approach. The diary entries are, are different, as Will says, they're laid out almost as to-do lists. And in a way, it suggests just how much really, really needed to be done. Because all those big words of the revolution, freedom, republic, independence, they could indulge all sorts of hopes, expectations and notions of what independence might be. The imminent reality of a state, whatever its form, meant that the lights had to be kept on and it was coming time for those plans to be borne out. It wasn't that Collins was without plans until this point. It is more that his diaries were not necessarily the place he chose to expand upon them. He did leave us hints, though, through those early diaries. One entry from back in November 1919 suggests his approach was quite a pragmatic one. It was about a meeting with John Charters, where he writes, they discussed the question of financial relations between Britain and Ireland, and also land purchase. So he's clearly planning at, at least what related financial relations might look like in the future after independence. On the 22nd of February 1920, he writes about meeting someone called Mr B about housing. Then you get more entries about things like a local government memorandum, another on the abolition of poor law idea. So he was in no doubt about the scale of the social and economic problems they faced. But in 1919 and 1920, there were limits to what could be achieved beyond keeping going as an underground government which explains the different character the 22 diary takes on. Immediately in January, he's writing words that he hasn't written before, words like estimates. He constantly writes the word estimates and then balances. He wants to know where he stood financially. By the 28th of June, he was taken with, as he writes, the question of financial returns with a note about meeting the, meeting the accountants on Monday. And also on the same day, he notes down question of Russian trade relations all in the same day. The following month, he wrote about the repayment of loans. And on the day that the National Army attacked the anti treatyites in the four courts, he was writing down a note about an overdraft. But in those changed circumstances of civil war, he was also writing things like £180,000 for defence. He was certainly taking over generally, as he called it, sizing up what was possible in the circumstances, what could be done. And as a result of this, new names start to appear in the diary that confirmed this idea of him taking over generally. As he said, on the 20th of April 1922, Dermot Fawcett's name appeared for the first time. Fawcett was an IRB man. He had served as the Republic's Consul General in the United States and was brought to London with the treaty delegation. By the time his name was written in the diary, he was acting secretary to the Provisional Government's Department of Economic Affairs. More often, though, came the initials KOS, which stood for Kevin O'Sheal, a judicial commissioner of the Dáil Land Commission. O'Sheal uh, was assistant legal advisor to the provisional government. And through March, April and May of 1922, Collins wrote variations of KOS and land purchase again and again. The urgency of a land bill was not lost on Collins. And his diary refers regularly to the importance of the Irish Convention Land Report uh, from 1918. This report would later contribute to the shape of the 1923 Land Act. Collins made several references to the National Land Bank, and he seemed particularly keen to meet with Department of Agriculture officials in these months. He was even occupied by the, or preoccupied by the Diseases of Animals Act in July of 1922. Michael Collins is not often associated with land and agricultural policy, but his 1922 diary might suggest 
that we reconsider uh, this omission. But it wasn't only land. Each separate ministry, he demanded a memo from them about a possible conference. So, and this suggests that each of them was going to come in for his intense scrutiny. And again, the diaries hint at some of these plans. He writes about housing, about a housing scheme, about waterworks, telegraph system, telephone system, another mention of a memo about schools, the Board of Trade, electricity undertakings were just some of his concerns that he mentions. He planned a meeting, as we'll see on, on the slide there on the right, with Dr Crowley of Siemens, which suggests that maybe he has his place in the history of what went on to become the Shannon scheme. In this phrase taking over generally, he seems to assume all sorts of responsibilities. He met with, as he wrote one day, teachers who had an address for me. He met with Labour representatives. And as the man with most power in the country, it was naturally assumed that he could fix everything. As he travels round the country, uh, making a case for the treaty, he made notes of individuals, grievances and expectations, things he needed to remember and put right. And you can see a whole variety of different ones. You can see here on the slide on the left, he's making a note about someone called Young in Dunmanway who, uh, and a link to the Christian Brothers School. Uh, and effectively, I think this relates to a local squabble about someone getting a teacher's job. And as Will mentioned er earlier, this could again have been one of those moments where someone stopped him on the campaign trail and asked him to put a local issue uh, to rights as they saw it. Throughout these months, he was marking out the character of the state. And you can see this not least in terms of the number of jobs listed there on the right. This, this is the number of, of new jobs he took on on the day that they took over Dublin Castle. He suddenly took on 14 new responsibilities. So his, his, the nature of his, of his work is increasing uh, by the moment. Given his actions at the time, what he intended that character of the new state to be is still very open to debate, though. And his diary, in many ways, does little to help us clarify his stance on all sorts of things. One very notable example, though, is that his diary records only the very public side of his Northern Ireland policy. He makes reference to things like note re-north opting out, protest to all governments re-north-east, etc. It was silent completely about the military activity he sanctioned along and across the border at the time. His diary had never been the place for him to sift the rights out from the wrongs, and that certainly did not change for him in 1922. And I think on that note, we we'll maybe stop and, 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 and if there's time for, for questions, we can, we can try and tackle them. Thank you. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute myself. That was absolutely fascinating. I have pages of notes and we do actually have one or two on with us. So um, yes. if the people that are on would like to ask a question, they can use the question and answer feature. Uh, so I'll be reading through my notes to try and make sense of what I was going to say. I mean, the obvious thing, guys, I suppose, is what you both have said. You know, this man was in the IRB. He was head of, uh, or, you know, certainly kind of understood secret societies and all that. So it was... This was not a diary where he was going to, you know, ever in, kind of incriminate himself. And yet there is a, a tremendous amount of information in it. But it must have been difficult in one way for you. Like you have must have an encyclopedic knowledge of, you know, what else was going on so that you could kind of cross reference things. So did you find that this gave you an insight into, you know, into certain elements of his personality or his work? Or did it um, like I was struck by the Austin Stack references, for instance, you know, um, I think I suppose I always thought they were they had nothing much to do with each other, and and then they you know they have a very public falling out, or certainly it seems ac acrimonious, but yet they seem to be working quite well together. Uh, you know, nineteen 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 twenty. Do you want to talk yeah. about him and Austin Stack a bit? Uh, no yeah. relation, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose I mean, yeah. So at a general level, it was definitely helpful that we had written the biographical study before. So we were coming with a certain base of background knowledge, but that certainly didn't, you know, reveal the meaning of, you know, a lot of the entries to us. So, uh, and there are still entries, which quite frankly, you know, we just don't know what they mean. And other scholars will tackle the diaries and they will, they will, you know, maybe figure those entries out or they will figure out that we were completely wrong in our interpretation of some of the entries we've tackled. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, so, so some of it involved also just digging around, like the 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 Matty Murphy funeral, for instance. There was sort of combined research there around identifying. Then you start finding the newspaper report of the funeral, which gave certain meaning to you know Matty's own background, and then figuring out from various Bureau of Military History statements, you know, the who his son was, and therefore you know adding an, a new layer to mm-hmm. our understanding of that particular entry. So it's just as you say that cross reference. Uh, is you know really is a, the key way of trying to f- to figure things out as regards stack um they got on really well and they were quite close really through 1918 1919 um they for instance there are letters where collins is writing into stack in prison saying this is these this is my personal library here and he writes him a full list of all the kind of of the kind of runs of magazines he has and books he has and saying you know whatever you want let me know and i'll send it in the post to you and all that kind of thing um and he's quite often refers to him as austin or oz in those entries but you can tell the diary actually he will refer to individuals either by their first name or their surname but but it's telling if he starts off referring to you by your first name and then switches to referring to you as by your surname so Mm -hmm. austin goes from being austin or oz to being stack at a certain point and that's not a good sign you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and then the same uh harry boland is harry uh when when you see him and then he becomes boland Mm -hmm. so um so you can sort of trace a subtle you know sort of subtle signs of de- deteriorating relationship mm-hmm. there in terms of how the name is used and, th- and things like that mm-hmm. um, and so there's that but generally speaking there's a phase where he he's working closely with stack because stack is really a very important prison leader and because collins is very concerned about prisons and so you can see there's constant communication at that point and then you can see just a falling away uh, and it's it's in part because they fall out i think but it's in part because they have less you know reason to directly interact day mm-hmm. upon day mm-hmm. you know van wants to add anything to, to that yeah i mean I, I think the the one of the the things i found most interesting about them was the the degree to which it brings our focus back to elements of the collins i think we had become familiar with through the book which in a way had been underestimated in terms of that public perception of him. He's very much seen as the man in the uniform, the you know, the the, the leader of, you know, the spy of the mm-hmm. world and all the rest of it. Where actually the diaries really confirm something that I think we were trying to get across in the book was the degree to which this is someone who is mainly found at a desk, is mainly writing letters, is mainly organizing, who is a minister for finance. Mm-hmm. In a way, they're the things that really dominate in the diaries. Maybe for those reasons that we mentioned in passing, and, and as you said, that he has to be secret. He has to keep that side of his life secret. He doesn't want to write things down. If these diaries get captured, he knows he's in trouble. Mm-hmm. So there could well be good reasons why that stuff isn't in the diaries as much as people may expect. But I think what it they do reinforces the degree to which we have to really think of this person as a politician as well as all those other things. Mm-hmm. But he is all of those different jobs. That he has on his his C, if he had to write his CV in 2021, he is very much, you know, the the the, the desk job person yeah. as opposed to the the the, the Ireland's the man who won the war, as Arthur Griffith calls him in the in the treaty debates. Yeah, um, well, I, I think, think that's what. Oh, sorry, we'll go ahead. Oh, okay. I was going to say that's what really struck me, and I mean, you know, I will confess, I'm uh, I love Michael Collins. <laughs> There's no objectivity here as a historian. Um. You know, I, that I think is that he was genuinely that impressive. You know, I mean, I, I think people try to recently, you know, someone was saying um, that, he, you know, he never fought and should that take from him? And, you know, what did he know about being on the run? Blah, 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 kind of thing. But, you know, he he probably did direct, you know, the operations in, in terms of um, the IRB and, and those kind of flying columns and all that. Certainly, we know he disagreed with De Valera, like on how to stage, you know, a war and the guerrilla aspect but look at all these other organizational things that he's doing not, not even just the money but sort of the welfare thing i was very struck by that the the teacher you know down in in towards the end of his life like that you know somebody got a job and maybe couldn't speak the language or was the language relevant and you know we know he worked in the constitution that first constitution it do, in a way do these diaries make you like regret the loss of him 
to the country. You know, he seems to have had a finger in almost every pie of this fledgling republic. And what do you think about that? Or am I glamorizing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, do you want? Uh, yeah, like, I mean, one of the, sorry, could you go ahead, Anne? Sorry. No, you no, ahead. you still, you go on. You still have a. No, one of the things I was going to say is that, I mean, what they do reinforce is his capacity for work, you know, which is re which is really striking. Uh, and there's absolutely no doubt about that. And certain skills that he has in terms around, you know, how managing organizations and his capacity for networking, uh, all those things are emerge very clearly uh, mm -hmm. from the from the diaries, I suppose. Um, and in the in the latter as what well, later sections of the paper was you know hinting at you know that he was beginning to think about the shape of the Ireland that might emerge but I suppose one of the things that is clear enough about him is that while he was absolutely sure about his desire for Irish independence um, and what well, he'd done a lot across a whole series of fields to secure that um, it's not so clear that he had very fixed or highly developed ideas really about what that Ireland should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure that the diaries altered that to a great extent. Uh, maybe a little bit in, towards the end when you're seeing, Anne is talking about you're seeing him having to deal with the practical implications of independent and he's having to try and derive, devise policy, you know, very rapidly. Um, but um, because, because we know so little about what he thought about that, we've had a tendency over the years, I think, to find that vacuum helpful mm -hmm. and to imagine the amazing things Michael Collins would have done if he had survived. Uh, and in some ways, we, we, we really can't know how effective he would have been as a leader of a new state as distinct from being a leader of a revolution you know mm -hmm. it's just one of those unknowables yeah. uh, maybe Anne, mm -hmm. i don't know if you want to add something yeah i mean i think the the diaries in a way kind of suggested a bit like as he behaved all the way through 2021 he was very good at also thinking he was better at doing other people's jobs than they were mm -hmm. and you kind of get the feeling how that might have grated quite a bit mm -hmm. in the cabinet as time went on because he's you know he's clearly gathering in ideas about all sorts of ministries that aren't really part of his 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 remit even though mm -hmm. as, as you know he's he's gathering in the money and all the rest at the same time I mean he's also very much a man of his time and I think again as, as Will said that vacuum he leaves has allowed us to and and that lack of that lack of writing about his his own thinking on these things has has, has allowed us to to forget that because he, he 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 can then become the champion of whatever we want him to be Mm -hmm. But, he, you know, sometimes his, the ideas he does express are are very much of the politics he's grown up with and of the time mm -hmm. he's he was from. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Jolie has made the point that if he'd lived, he might well have started what something that looked like Fianna Fáil, such was the closeness of some of his ideas to De Valera. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I think, you know, what the traces he leaves is maybe not in the diaries, but in, in other places would suggest he's very much of that movement that produced them. Um, and we kind of can't take him out of that. I think it's, I was really struck when we were doing the other book. Um, uh, he's, I think it's, as it Michael Hayes talked about him in terms of, you know, when he died, we were able to replace him within 10 days. When Parnell died, it took 10 years. Mm. Which again suggests the degree to which he is part of something bigger. He is an important part. Mm. But maybe one of the things that's most remarkable about him is that he creates, he's good at creating structures that can outlive him. Mm -hmm. and that maybe suggests he needs lots of those other people around him as well he can't he can't do much without them and they can't you know that they, they could clearly continue without him he left that mm -hmm. structure behind mm -hmm. i think we maybe underestimate that a little bit too yeah gee that is um a kind of a stark statement isn't it by you know, when you think Sorry. because maybe it was that he was more successful like at nation building or our at structure building that you know parnell was more ephemerate kind of because there there wasn't a a system so I suppose maybe that's something too I, I just have two more questions and Rita thanked you she was uh, she'll have to listen to it again she said from Florida uh, my one question is obviously because 21 they're in the height you know it's the very a very violent year with the black and tans and the auxiliaries he clearly isn't writing anything until he goes to London and has a bit of time and we know he has those other letters from being on the run is De Valera absent so in the diaries too I mean I know De Valera is in the States the fact that Collins is so preoccupied with the money 
do you think there's a, a little hint there at, at like where is this American money, you know, and when will that come in? And, and does he talk about that? The Blair doesn't get too many mentions at all, really. There's mm. about, there's about it's, between, is it seven or nine kind of direct references, and some what? of them are very vague. Um, yeah. You don't even, like, I mean, you look at moments when you think he should be there and it's, it's he's not there, which is maybe suggests he was so present in in his mind or in in the moment that he didn't need to write it down he didn't need to put it down mm-hmm. um in that respect yeah it is one of the surprises it's one of the big gaps that and, and again that sort of suggests maybe the degree to which we have read the period through the collins de valera or what do we call it the relationship that then becomes tense that then becomes opposition mm-hmm. and we've maybe read the periods too narrowly and too simply through that relationship um, mm-hmm. I I was just struck Mrs. Dev was probably there in direct reference just as much. Mm-hmm. He was clearly very fond of her. Um, clearly sending letters to her. Um, and we've known that, but it, again, it's just interesting to see it reinforced in the diary that this was something he was reminding himself to do, and it was a fixture mm-hmm. in the diary to to sort of interact with her. But again, I think it does raise those questions. And again, you can think of like how much the De Valera Collins relationship has been reinvigorated for another generation by Neil Jordan which I was really struck mm. recently he kind of reflected that he maybe hadn't hadn't treated De Valera as 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 he might have in in the film I think he he mentioned that recently in an interview but mm. it I think it does beg questions about how we've conceived of the two individuals but also of the period itself mm-hmm. um, there's an awful lot more going on than just this relationship between these two individuals mm-hmm. um, I just I'd say on the diaspora, what's very clear is uh, how important and uh, contact with London is in his life and with mm. the Irish in London. Um, he's the key. Per- Art O'Brien's name appears again and again and again in the diaries. Um, and uh, O'Brien and indeed you can chart their falling out because O'Brien too. Um, O'Brien was disgruntled that he wasn't given as prominent a position as he felt he deserved on the treaty negotiation team uh, and then post the treaty O'Brien is anti-treaty and does a very sharp falling falling out eventually um, but during 1920 and um, and indeed 1919 you can see um, like um, Collins really shouldn't have been managing that relationship it should have been a relationship for the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, but Collins again with this tendency to take on a job uh, when he thinks he can do it, basically, I think, kind of seizes control of it, partly because, you know, he had spent so many years in London and he knows those people. He knows O'Brien. Um, mm-hmm. And if you look at the Dáil Éireann papers, one of the single biggest collection of correspondence from 1919, 1920 is, is that... Collins O'Brien there's almost daily telegrams and letters going back and forth between them Mm -hmm. so so he's much more conscious I think of the Irish in England and the Irish in London uh, than he is of the Irish American connection although you know it's not entirely absent but I would say for Collins it's the it's the London it's the London London is in his field of vision more often Mm -hmm. than than America is Mm -hmm. but I think even with the relationship with Dev it's again back to Will's point it just shows you again and again how you need to read the diaries alongside lots yeah. and lots of other things. Because if you just look to the diaries as being this missing piece, you're gonna you're gonna be disappointed or you're gonna get a very different and maybe wrong answer yeah. to whatever question you're asking because they only really make sense in the mix of a, a sort of a patchwork of lots of other things. Yeah. So I mean if you're looking for an answer to the Devil Air relationship, you're not gonna you're probably Gosh, not gonna get it yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. But you need to go elsewhere. Yeah. 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 But and as you said, that is kind of enlightening in its own way. You know, maybe Dev was out of sight, out of mind, or whatever it was. You know, and and he was either happy for him to get on with that job, or you know, he he didn't kind of count him as important really uh, at home. You know, um. So in that sense, the diaries I think are more tantalizing, kind of than you know, enlightening. And and we don't really get a sense of him as an ideologue, like or you know do and you kind of mentioned it too like that we don't have this insight into the type of Ireland he saw except for these little fleeting glances that he wasn't forgetting the north for instance you know so do you think did Collins have an overarching philosophy or was I mean this gets to the crux I guess of the the treaty and and the compromise like did he he seems to have believed like that it was you know the freedom to achieve freedom that it was workable to get that little amount first and then to continue on later on 
do you believe that or or you know where do you think he you yeah, know um, what was his belief yeah about compromise yeah. well one one of the things that's one of the things that's difficult about this is because the moment when he begins to articulate his position most clearly is actually the moment when he has to defend the treaty mm-hmm. so the the way he expresses it, the, the beliefs he articulates then are they're part of an argument so yeah. so knowing the extent to which they are things he has to say in public to to make that argument or the extent to which they are his core beliefs is you know if, if that makes sense if that mm-hmm. if that dichotomy makes sense is quite difficult um mm-hmm. but i suppose it if colin at that time if collins was to say what his achievement would have been it would have been uh that the British military withdrawal from Ireland. Okay, that's that's as far as he was concerned was the key objective. And he felt, or at least this is what he argued, that everything flowed from that. Once you had the British army withdrawing and, uh, you know, there was some degree of autonomy, then there's a capacity for, uh, you know, Irish nationalists, as he saw, to start making their own decisions and their own choices and so on. And he gives you some hints of a sort of, you know, the kind of... Um, I, I, you know, Ireland, he would have liked, you know, there's in those arguments, uh, those p- articles published around the treaty's time, you can see him articulating a desire to see, you know, standard stuff, you know, the Irish language embraced mm-hmm. uh, in terms of socioeconomic, he very much sees a sort of small or medium farmer world, a bit like, you know, de Valera in terms of uh, uh, Ireland in that regard he talks about tillage uh he focuses he is interested in economic development but it's like um and he's genuinely concerned that Siemens reference does reflect mm. a genuine concern for what he refers to as white power so water water power is a thing from the sort of you know coal in the British context mm. um so so those kind of ideas are there um and he's there's a skepticism about I suppose um big capital okay but he's certainly not socialist either Mm -hmm. so you know he's he he's uh in that sense he's probably reflecting um ideas about cooperativism and some sort of you know catholic social thought of the late 19th early 20th century which would have been skeptical both about socialism on the one hand and Mm -hmm. and you know capitalism on the other hand Mm -hmm. but you know, it's as I say, there you're, you're you're trying to sketch out his mind from limited enough evidence compared to some other figures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think it's it was quite interesting the treaty debates. He's the one person who very quickly points out that it was accepting the invitation to go to London. That's when the compromise was made. This was just yeah. about working out its its details. Yeah. Um. You know, I think in a way that makes. Whether he's trying and he's again, you have to think. Well, who is he speaking to in the treaty debates? There's there's one audience in the Dáil. There's there's many other audiences in the IRB, in the Volunteers, in lots of different places. So he's, you know, is he again? As Will said, he's 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 trying to express himself at the point which he's trying to make an argument to convince people to accept the treaty. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very striking some of the things he says to Hayden Talbot, in that which eventually become. Uh, that that first biography of Collins in twenty three are are very much again shaped in the in the heat of trying to get get the 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 treaty accepted by as many people as possible in the country. So you're you're getting a very particular view of, you know, I didn't want to go to London and don't throw me into the glare of a conference in London. They they'll find out that I'm only made of of clay and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, when you when you look at some of his how he expresses his views on things elsewhere. I would imagine it would have been very difficult to keep him away from London or him the idea of him not wanting to go to London, not being in in at that point, it would have been really strange. And again, this is comes back to our conception of who we think he was. Mm-hmm. Because if you think of him as the military figure, the elusive kind of Scarlet Pimpernel figure, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe he shouldn't have gone to London, but he's the Minister for Finance first and foremost. Mm-hmm. It would be very strange if the Irish didn't send the Minister for Finance to London. And when you think about it, he's the only person in the delegation who's on all the subcommittees of the treaty negotiations. So he's there's three subcommittees as well as the main meetings, and he's the only one in all three. He's the mm-hmm. in that sense he be, he's his overview of all the different uh, aspects of it are are really interesting. So, mm-hmm. I mean, what 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 he himself would have done done the treaty again as part of that what that what if that massive what if question, mm-hmm. but. 
we have to think as well from the perspective of what things like with dominion status not being a republic yes but dominion status at that point in 1920 late 21 early 22 is a very vague thing indeed mm -hmm. um it's it's a thing that's moving and changing and developing as they're writing down those two words dominion status mm -hmm. and as the 20s show it keeps kind of pushing out and out and out and out mm -hmm. um so it's a it's a it's not a fixed point, but I think, yeah, as Will says, I mean, his views are echoed by Sean McKeown and others in the treaty debates. If you get the British Army out, then we mm -hmm. can start to do, mm -hmm. you have you have that room to do what you want to do mm -hmm. with admittedly a, a form of independence that they hadn't maybe ideally hoped for. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. But again, it's, it, it takes us very quickly back to what if with yeah. Collins. Yeah, um, yeah. That's always the challenge. But um. I don't know. I mean, I think it's 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 interesting in a way that the degree to which we slip even think, you know, even looking at the period from this distance, we tend to slip very quickly into those who vote for the treaty stop being Republican in their instinct. They become pro-treaty versus anti-treaty or we slip into pro-treaty versus Republican. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it, it would be mm -hmm. tricky to, to say that Colin stopped being Republican in his instincts because yeah. he signed this document. You know? yeah. And even like Will, as you were saying about the economics and, and, you know, maybe the capital versus investment versus agriculture, you know, he was aide de camp to James Connolly, so he may have been more left leaning originally, you know, than we thought or, you know. So, yeah, this was absolutely fascinating. I, I You know, it's another layer to a kind of an elusive character, but I think one who looms large still on Irish imagination, but also the Irish American. So thank you guys very much for this talk. Um, tomorrow we have Dr. Kean McMahon from Nevada, who's going to talk to us about the coffin ships uh, as part of our Black 47 commemoration series. So we're looking forward to that too. But I thank you both very much. And we're looking forward to, we will have the book in stock in our own gift shop. Or of course, it's available online, uh, but it's better to shop local. So uh, <laughs> thanks very much for that. And uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah. I'm sure we'll hear from you next year again, because this we're going to continue our series. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye, bye. Richard. Thanks for tuning in.